Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for, for being here this morning. Um, my name is Richard Hansen. Um, I'm a, a freelance photographer based in Sheffield. So this is actually my, my home. I'm not from Sheffield, but this is where I, where I live and work. Um, my, my work involves working for press, a lot of uh, national newspapers and uh, magazines, but then also um, very widely internationally. So I've just come back from Congo uh, for a, a week in Congo. I was in uh, Ivory Coast doing a story on HIV and AIDS earlier this year, and then Niger covering the West Africa food crisis in April, May this year. So. Um, that's kind of my background. I'll show you a little, bit of, a little bit of the kind of work I do for about five minutes, and then um, I'll talk about Haiti. Uh, because after the earthquake in Haiti uh, in January 2010, I visited the country three times. I spent a total of two months in Haiti in the, in the year following the earthquake. Um, and that work became part of an exhibition, as well as being covered in a lot of media uh, in the UK. And so this, was, this is just a way of talking you through some of the practicalities, some of the ethical issues, and some of the kind of uh, creative issues of being a photojournalist in a situation which is so um, traumatic and dramatic, but also in some ways quite uh, quiet in terms of the aftermath of the story. So um, I will talk, I hope, for about half an hour. I'll try and do that. And then we'll have some time for questions. It may be slightly longer than half an hour. Um, but hopefully, I will leave some time for questions at the end there. I'm going to use a couple of quotes from other photographers, people who I respect enormously in, in my field. So Bill Brandt is, a, is an incredibly well-known um, photographer from the uh, second half of the 20th century. And he talks about uh, how most photographers would feel a certain embarrassment in admitting publicly that they carried within them a sense of wonder. I've just started, is that okay? <laughs> I, thought, I looked at the time and thought we'd start. Um, that they carried within them a sense of wonder. Yet without it, the sense of wonder, they would not produce the work they do, whatever their particular field. Now, for me, that's a very, um, very key approach to the kind of uh, work that I want to do. I want to understand the world through a, through a sense of awe, of wonder, of interest, at least. Um, Eve Arnold talks about curiosity being the driving force for her work. And that's the same sort of idea, that actually, to be a good journalist, to, to be a good photographer, you have to be really genuinely interested in the world. You have to really want to understand what's going on and, and question and, and start to deal with some of, those, some of the issues that are, that are really underlying how we exist. So in, the, in, in my work, I work with some famous people. This is the Archbishop of Canterbury for the next week or two. Um, some very unhappy people. This is our coalition uh, partner. There are no happy pictures of, of Nick Clegg. He's always sad. Uh, there were some notorious people. Um, David Blunkett is my own MP, was my MP, um, and well, still is actually, and he's resigned twice, obviously from the previous government, and Tony Blair, you'll, you'll know. Uh, and you may not know Cliff Richard, but he was, uh, for a previous generation, a very famous singer in the UK, a massive um, number of albums sold, very bland music, but very successful in his field. Uh, so I've worked with you know, some famous people. With Cliff, we did a story about HIV um, in, um, excuse me, that's probably me actually, in Cambodia. So just to show you, famous people, a bit of a crossover uh, into then normal life. Um, for me, actually famous people aren't very interesting. You do come across them in the things that you do professionally. But Mary Ellen Mark, who is another photographer who I hugely admire, and is just an extraordinary, has an extraordinary body of work, talks about reality is always extraordinary. And that's, again, a really key part for me in my work, that actually looking at normal lives are what makes me tick. It's, what's got, it's what gets me excited in the morning. It's what gets me going out taking pictures, is looking at normal lives and seeing what's extraordinary about us as humanity. Um, so in terms of press work, that's often stories about people who um, you wouldn't necessarily notice as you pass them on the street. This is for The Guardian, um, and about um, abuse in Catholic care homes in, in Ireland um, back in the 50s and 60s, and it was a story which, or even to the, into the 70s. Um, so that's the, kind, that's the kind of work which I'm more interested in, in terms of the UK, kind of stories that matter about people. 
In terms of international news, I don't often end up covering um, the immediate effect of a disaster or a conflict. I'm just going to show you two images from, from two situations where I did. This is actually hard news. So this is in 1994. Uh, the Rwanda genocide started in April 1994. And uh, by June 1994, huge numbers of refugees moved across the border into what was then Zaire. Um, fleeing from the liberating army coming down from the north, uh, the Tutsi-led army coming into the north of Rwanda, and uh, the people who'd been doing the genocide fled across the border into Zaire, and one and a half million people ended up camping on a volcanic plain just to the um, west of, of Rwanda. Um, I was there for only four days uh, in a very, very short, very traumatic experience. Uh, 30,000 people died of cholera in, the week, in that week that I was there. It was the, one of the most intense cholera outbreaks that there's probably ever been in the modern, in the modern era. Um, and there were bodies on the side of the road. There was journalists who had been all around the world covering wars and everything else were saying, we've never seen anything like this. I was 25, and I had certainly never seen anything like it. So this was my first experience of, of conflict and disaster and of, of mass, uh, mass death. And it was an incredibly traumatic experience for me and left me with a lot to deal with for the rest of my life, actually. I went through trauma counseling later on, uh, and this was certainly a point which marks a, a shift in my own professional um, experience. One of the next things that I did that was hard news was the Albania border um, during the Kosovo conflict. So the, um, the fighting was going on and Kosovo refugees were coming across. This is in 1999, so this is actually five years later when I was much uh, more used to working in kind of situations of, of, of trauma. And um, the, come in, come in. <laughs> Um, so this is, again, another hard news story. The refugees were coming across the border. All of the men were being removed on one side of the border and held, and the women and the children were coming across into Albania and being, let them, being free then to move further through the country to safety. But obviously, they'd just lost their husbands, fathers, um, brothers and brothers. So there was a, that was a very traumatic experience for them. So just to show you, those are two... Uh, very intense news situations where the whole press pack was there. There was a lot of other journalists. But that's not really how I spend a lot of my international work. A lot of it is around the ends of conflict and the effects that it has on people um, after the news event has gone. So this is Eritrea, um, just before independence in 1993. Um, Southern Sudan in 1996, again, a, there was very little coverage in the news at this point, but there was a very major civil war going on. So this was a point where the news agenda was elsewhere, but uh, there was a story to be told. And then just now, just this year in Niger, this is, the, this is people waiting for um, a food bank in, in Niger. It's a, it's a crisis which was very quiet, uh, which got a little bit of coverage, but it never quite reached sort of um, the levels that it needed to, to, to make a difference in terms of um, people's lives. So I have heard very positive things about how the response to this particular crisis has gone. But there was no other journalist in this situation. This was me working alongside a, a charity, an NGO, uh, to uh, report on what they were doing. So this is much more the kind of work that I'm involved in. Haiti is um, obviously one of, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and was before the earthquake as well as obviously now afterwards. In 1996, I visited Haiti and it was, it was a very hard place to work. It was, this sums it up in some ways. The, the, the ground is incredibly rocky. People were having to farm using pickaxes rather than a plow. It was not an easy place to work and it wasn't easy professionally. It, was, it wasn't a, a place of, of kind of much joy. It was, it was a very heavy kind of environment. And I didn't really anticipate ever working back in Haiti again. But then, um, obviously, you will, you'll remember uh, the, the uh, earthquake on the 20, uh, in uh, 2010. Here's another quote from Bill Allard, who's a National Geographic photographer. Um, and he just talks about the spiritual stake that we have as photographers and as journalists in the stories that we tell. The reason, again, the things that connect in our hearts with the people who we're working with. Rather, so you, it's very different from the idea of being a dispassionate observer um, and much more about being an engaged human being with your fellow human beings. And 
it's an interesting quote. It may be overstated, but it says something about the values that, again, I respond to when I read, when I read that. I, I find that a very compelling idea to be talking about um, a spiritually driven uh, concept of working rather than just, or, or even a humanistic uh, approach to the work rather than just being this dispassionate observer. Obviously, you need to have a distance. You need to be able to, com to do what you're doing professionally, but you need to do that with a humanity. Otherwise, you, you lose something of yourself in that process. So on the 12th of January 2010, at five, just before 5 to 5 in the evening, so people still in school, still in their offices, still at university, there was this a magnitude 7 earthquake in just, to the, just to the west of Port-au-Prince that killed somewhere between, and the figures are exceptionally hard to pin down, um, somewhere between 80,000 and 300,000 people. And I think that the chances of us ever knowing the exact figure are very slim by the, the, the figures I've been looking at. And this is the immediate aftermath. And this was, you know, I, I remember very clearly the day that it happened. I remember hearing about it and thinking, I think I'm going to go. I think that's the story which I will be involved in. And I didn't really know at that point quite how involved I would be. But I did know that it was a story that I, was, I really responded to as soon as I heard about it and wanted to be part of. So I wasn't doing immediate news. The, the, call, the first call I got to go and work in Haiti was about uh, six weeks later. Um, the charity who I work with usually, normally is part of the Disasters Emergencies Committee, which is the big um, umbrella body for all of the largest UK um, charities. And they do an appeal which goes out uh, across the board. Rather than having individual appeals from each individual charity, they, they do a, a generalized appeal, and the money gets shared out. And they're one of the four largest um, international NGOs in the UK. And I got a call maybe six or seven weeks after the earthquake, and they said, we have a team in country. We'd like you to go on Monday. This call was on Thursday. And then they canceled. So it was all very dramatic, run around. Oh, no, we can't do it. Uh, and, but then two weeks later, they came back and said, actually, yes, we do. And so 10 weeks after the earthquake, uh, so two and a half months afterwards, I flew into Port-au-Prince and um, started working on, on the story with a journalist. This is, this is two and a half months afterwards now. So this is uh, just to give you an idea of some of the devastation that was right there in front of you without any searching at all. Um, the very beginnings of the cleanup operation. And there were still bodies trapped in the rubble. There was, you know, you'd walk past a building and you, could, you, you would be aware of, through the smell of, of you know, in the area around, that there were still bodies in particular parts of buildings. Uh, so it's still very, very raw for the people around and still very physically dangerous. I mean, this obviously is a landscape which is not safe to work in um, without exceptional care. Um, however, uh, what wasn't being reported and what you, obviously isn't really a story was that large parts of Port-au-Prince still looked like this. So in fact, it was, a, it was an earthquake that had hit some parts of the city and wiped them out completely. But round the corner, you'd find a main shopping street that was completely intact. So a very unusual situation, quite a strange um, thing to be part of. Because you'd be driving along, you'd go to a supermarket, you'd buy your, you know, you could buy a bottle of wine or a bottle of, you know, fizzy pop, or you could buy bread and all everything that you'd want at a price, and then you'd turn the corner and be confronted with destruction. And that was something which, obviously, if you lived there, was even more uh, emotional and more, more draining. Uh, huge numbers of people, and again, the figures that are, that are around are very difficult to pin down, but into the millions of people were living in the open. So this is actually a school basketball court uh, where one of the partner organizations I was working with was, was part of, and they, were, they just literally put a tarpaulin across the whole court, and people were living in tents, but underneath the tarpaulin. That's fine if it's sunny and it's dry and you can use toilets and everything else. But obviously, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy that just came through New York and caused such destruction there, went through Haiti first. And that wiped out vast numbers of these tents because they were totally flimsy now. They're just really, people are still living in them, maybe half a million people still living in tents. Uh, and in these camps that are just set up all over the place. They sprung up overnight. One of the things that on that first trip, so 10 weeks afterwards, was, that was really striking was that everybody just wanted to talk. It was, it, was, it was unlike anywhere I've ever been in terms of how willing people were, how desperate people were to talk. Um, because 
everybody had suffered such loss. It had been, I think it had been very hard for people to talk to each other about what they'd gone through because they were aware of each other's pain and each other's suffering. So when we as, uh, as visitors came in from outside and said, can you tell us that, your story? There was a real need to talk through the whole process of what had happened. So the story of the mother who was making her children's lunch for school for the next day, she was downstairs, they were upstairs, they died, she survived. She wanted to tell the story and she sat there and told us the story and wept and we wept and you should. You saw lots of life around, lots of, there's, uh, there was a lot of orphans obviously from the um, earthquake and we worked with some partners who were trying to find ways of, of caring for them uh, well. Again, this, this kind of story where the decision you make about which direction you take as you leave a building and whether you survived because you took this corridor or you died because you took that corridor. This family here, their, one of their daughters was with them in this building, which looks impossible to survive in. They, they all survived, but their other daughter was at a friend's and she was killed. And you, just this, the random nature of where you were, which direction you turned was... Um, constantly coming out. And I'll show you pictures of the interview process in a moment. We'll get through to that. Um, so just these vast areas of camps that people were living in. We, had very, we were very fortunate that we had access because we were working with um, partner organizations that had been in Haiti for a long time that were well-established Haitian organizations. So with Haitian staff, with Haitian values, and a, an understanding both of culture and language and what was needed on the ground. So we were, we were very fortunate in being able to do that. Um, and that meant that we were able to access stories that would have been very difficult to perhaps find otherwise. So people like uh, this woman, um, she was, um, her husband was the pastor of a church. Where the the organisation I was working with is a church-based organisation. Um, and she was um, just cooking. The wall in the kitchen fell over on her. She's called Giselle. And uh, she actually had to be helicoptered out to an American uh, warship in the middle of the... Um, the bay in Port-au-Prince and had her foot amputated because it was so badly damaged. Um, part of the story is obviously about the response, so you're looking for ways of illustrating that. Uh, the UN had a very strong presence in Haiti but a very mixed presence because of the American, there was a very significant American um, kind of colonial aspect that had been going on and still goes on. Um, in Haiti, and also because of uh, you'll have followed later on in the year, uh, people caught cholera. Haiti, Haiti didn't have any cholera at all before the earthquake. Nepalese troops came in as UN, peace, uh, UN kind of aid workers, and they brought cholera with them, which then spread and killed a lot of people. So there's all the complexity. So you're constantly looking as a photographer for ways of illustrating that without necessarily being totally literal about how it works. But again, the, the complexities of the story are always there and you're trying to build a, la build a layered story. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of things that got then used into press and into websites um, and how, you know, again, how the press and the media respond to stories which we were pitching. So I was working for the charity I was working with but trying to get stories placed into national media. So this is um, Marjorie Septus. Her baby, uh, Levensley, this, this young lad here, was born two hours after the earthquake. So the building she was in collapsed on top of her, her house. She was knocked unconscious. And when she came to, she was having her baby a month early. And so he, is, he was dubbed the miracle baby. Um, it became um, a story that then got featured in various places, including the Daily Mirror. Uh, it's a very good tabloid story because you've got this wonderful thing, a baby survives the earthquake and it's born. And, and in one sense, that's, that's a bit cheesy and it's a bit hard to deal with, but it's also reaching a very specific um, market, which is very important for um, these kind of international stories. You need to be able to have hooks that actually engage people in a way that perhaps um, isn't what I would necessarily how I would choose to do it, but it's a, it actually is a real story of a real person's life and, and, and gets Daily Mirror readers engaged with the story in Haiti. And they can be very generous, you know, the tabloid readers can be very generous in their giving if they understand what the story is. And that's not too patronizing a statement. Um, and we were able, one of the great things about this trip was we were able, the series of trips, we were able to go back and visit and actually see um, 
lots of the people we visited on the first trip again and again over the three times I was there. So we went and visited her, and this is, this is um, six months on, and this was the image. There was an exhibition that came out of this. This is the image that's, that was in the exhibition, and I'll just mention those as we go through, um, just so that they're, they're kind of clear which ones were the final images that got used. Um, this is Isseline Selney. She lost um, her arm and her hand during the earthquake. So she's a double amputee, which is obviously a hugely difficult thing in terms of your life. Um, but she had um, support to build uh, a small business. She had family support, but she also had support from the organization that I was working with. Um, and she was starting to rebuild a life in this enormous camp, um, despite what she'd been through. So very, again, a very uplifting story. And this is a year on. We worked with, um, with Matt Price from the BBC, which is him on the left, here he is on the left, uh, and we introduced, we put them together. So we, I was working with the press officer um, for the organization I was with, and this was um, the story that ran on the, on the news immediately after, I think, the World Cup. So it must have been, or European Cup, so it must have been six months after, sorry, not a year after. And um, it was late in the evening, and it was probably the only positive story on the BBC News that night at the six-month anniversary, um, amidst a lot of kind of very critical news about the way that the, um, the rubble hadn't been cleared and the rebuilding hadn't happened. In, in, within the piece that they put together, they ran this short interview um, with, with Iselle Isseline, sorry, I'm going to get her name right, Isseline, and it was very positive showing that some things were being done. And that's an important balance between the kind of the harsh reality of actually a lot of stuff needed to still be, still to be done, but also things were happening. So um, it's, very, it's very encouraging to actually be able to get these stories in front of the national um, news media. And this is just the filming and just showing the kind of context in which that was happening. Talking about that very briefly, the logistics of that kind of trip are obviously quite complex. You need resources. You couldn't just turn up in Haiti because there was nowhere to stay. Uh, and the organization I was working with, with Tier Fund, were up in the mountains a lot around um, the central southern part of Haiti, uh, which was quite a neglected part of the story. And we had to, sorry, there's a few pictures of me, I apologize. And I'm wearing the same clothes, I think, in every picture, which just shows the kind of resources that we had available. Um, but we were camping, so it was very basic. I usually end up staying in guest houses, at least, when I'm traveling. But we were camping up in the mountains. Um, and in Port-au-Prince itself, there was no safe housing. So we ended up camping uh, in, a, in a compound, uh, which was not really secure, but it was more secure than anywhere else we could find. Uh, but given all that, even, even with the roads as they were, we able, because we actually were working with an organization, we had the capacity to use some of their vehicles. Um, and that was essential. We couldn't have reached the places we needed to. You know, this is a, a river which we were driving down. Um, without the actual resources of a four-wheel drive, it's hugely expensive. If you were freelance, you'd be in a real, uh, you'd be in a very dangerous position because actually to make enough money from a story to pay for the things you need would be almost impossible. So you'd end up living in a very, in even less safe conditions than we were and traveling in far less safe conditions. And it's one of those real quandaries that you end up in as a, as a freelance, I'm, I'm freelance, but I work a lot with, with agencies. How do, you, how do you finance a trip? How do you actually make yourself safe? How do you um, operate in a way that is not gonna end up with you just never getting home because you've actually made a decision that's, that's story-led rather than safety-led? And that's a very difficult balance to get, to get right. This is Esther, who I was traveling with on that first trip. This was actually one of the most terrifying bits of driving I've ever been on. This, this vehicle we were in at this point on the first trip was really unsafe and had uh, very poor brakes and had very poor um, control. And this road, I don't know if you can see clearly, but we, this is the end of the bit where we've terrified, but the drops off on both sides were significant. And if we, there was points where we could easily have lost control, uh, we weren't totally sure of our driver. And it was one of the points where I felt least comfortable in a vehicle. Just, and I'm not making a big deal of that because there was so much else going on. But just to say there's a safety aspect to working in these kind of environments, which is sometimes hard to, to kind of fathom before you go. Uh, but having said all of that, even here, I had power every night. We had an office that we had access to um, and could use, and there was power most of the time. And there was even broadband, Wi-Fi broadband available, and I was able to wire pictures back to the UK on a, not necessarily every day, but on a regular basis. So the extraordinary thing is that 
even in a disaster situation like, like the, the Haiti, Haiti earthquake, it wasn't hard to find the resources to do the technolo technology side of the job. Um, I'd taken far more kit than I normally do just to make sure that I had enough to make the job possible if I had no power. And in the end, I didn't use a lot of my backup equipment because I didn't need to. It was much easier. So, quick stories. So, education was a key thing. I, I work a lot in education. I work with the Times Education Supplement in the UK. They were a major client of mine at the time. Um, so, one of the uh, stories that the, the organization I was working with were doing a lot in rebuilding schools. So, I pitched the story to the Times Education Supplement and said, look, let's do a story about Haitian schools being rebuilt. So this was um, what they called a transitional school. So they were, this wasn't permanent, obviously, but it was halfway to the school that was built then a year in. So it was to keep the children in education. All, a lot of schools in Haiti were destroyed. You could easily have lost a year, two years, or three years of a child's education. And that's a huge human cost, which is unseen. It's a very hidden story. Um, so Tier Fund were really working alongside UNICEF to get schools going again very quickly. And this then ran as a double page spread in the Times Education Supplement. So that was really, for me, very satisfying because it was a link between two quite separate parts of my professional life. It was the, the, the work I did with charities, but also the newspaper work. And it made that link very clear. We worked, uh, I'll show you some more stuff about schools in a minute when we've got, uh, get towards the end. This is, these are images from the exhibition uh, that came through. This was rebuilding roads, which uh, became the key image for the exhibition, which ran in London at Westminster Central Hall and in Sheffield at the workstation. I, I made sure it came to Sheffield because it's my, my hometown. Um, but that got a lot of coverage, and I'll show you that very briefly just as we come to the end. The, the key thing to making an exhibition or a series of stories work is actually just having enough stories that make sense and that actually are engaging to people. So this is a woman called Yolande Dorsius. 27 members of their family live in the same house now um, since the earthquake. And in fact, being inside her house didn't feel safe. There was big cracks in the walls and they slept outside at night. They didn't feel safe sleeping inside. They used it for storage, but they didn't, um, but they didn't want to sleep in there in case another earthquake came. They, they've been able to set up a small business and uh, start working with that, um, which has been fantastic in terms of rebuilding things. And more rebuilding. A lot of the stories I was doing were about rebuilding. This was about rebuilding schools. It's quite a nice picture. I like it anyway, because it feels like you're not quite sure where she's going, but it doesn't look like a good place. In fact, it was, <laughs> it was fine, but it has that sense of, wow, what's going on? And it gives you a sense of the scale of, of the landscape in Haiti. One of the things that made the earthquake so... Um, disastrous in some ways is the topography, the shape of the land in Haiti is very, uh, very hilly and very steep and uh, lots of the buildings just slid down uh, into ravines. That was part of the problem. Uh, this is Frank Murray, who is a baker. And this is all natural light. It was a wonderful moment. This is a bakery that was restarted, again, with funds from one of the organizations that uh, I was working with and uh, they're just starting small businesses so it's a good news story it's a way of showing that showing the strength of, of character and the resilience of the of the Haitian people we were meeting and again and again we came across people who'd been through terrible terrible things I mean this this whole business was completely destroyed with a small grant they were able to get the business up and running again and it means the economy can start going and it's a story where you go this isn't just people who need help. This is people who are helping themselves and with a little bit of, a little bit of um, facilitation, things can change completely in the, in the country. And again and again, we came across that, sto that kind of story. This, this very happy looking woman, she's not so happy looking, uh, but she's Amelia Dusselion. She's 68 and this is the foundations for her new house. And she talked about, this is a year after the earthquake, she said, living outside is hard, and it's time to move inside. We're all very happy about that. And that's, that's great. This was it's a good quote. She, she, was, she was unhappy because she'd had actually quite a difficult year, but she was actually looking forward to getting into her house. And this woman is called uh, Logina Innocent. Uh, this is her actually inside her new home. Uh, she chased off the previous film crew who turned up uh, with a machete, apparently. Uh, so we were quite cautious. She had actually benefited and was <laughs> genuinely warm uh, when we visited, but she'd scared the previous people who'd visited her. Uh, this is a solar light that was part of the process of, of uh, 
giving people equipment to get their houses going again. And she was very pleased with that because it meant she could see, um, it meant that she could see uh, what, the, what uh, bugs and things were moving around her house at night. Sorry, that, I think that is me. So she was, yeah, it's very nice to do. And we started shooting pictures at this point with a view to possibly doing an exhibition. I, I very rarely go back to a place again and again. It's three visits in a year is exceptional uh, for, for any journalist, really. Um, so I started shooting pictures that had a bit more kind of, of, a, of a visual twist to them that were not necessarily just straight journalism. Another quick quote from Yusuf Kash, um, talking about the, the hard to define secret hidden within everyone. And the attempt to capture this on film, or in my case, digitally, has been my life's work. Well, I like the idea of photographing people's internal strength. And this is three people who I met. So I'll just go through these very quickly, because I'm aware I'd like to leave some time for questions. But people who had a very profound impact on me and left a, left a real impression. This is the context of the interviews I was talking about, where we, were, we had uh, a lot of um, people coming to tell us their stories. Uh, this is Esther, who I was working with, and now this is our translator. But I was standing at the back of this group, and, th and this man, Kine, came up to me, and he was um, somebody who I just immediately uh, clicked with. We got on well. He spoke reasonably good English, which was fantastic, because I didn't need to go through a translator. And he just started talking about his life, and this is his family's home that had collapsed. And I'll just read you his quote, because he, he summed up, in some ways, for me, what, what happened on the day. He said, I started the day on January the 12th with everything a man could want, a wife, a family, a house. At the end of the day, it was all gone. I lost everything, even my wallet. It was just our baby and me who survived. And he was very gracious, very gentle. He wasn't asking for anything. He was just wanting to share his experience. And we visited him um, three times. And on the third visit, so a year after the earthquake, we didn't do a story. We didn't interview him. We didn't uh, do any pictures apart from this. This is uh, Lindsay, who I was working with on this particular visit. We just visited him where he was and had a, had a coke together and said goodbye, basically. And so it was, for me, again, very unusual. It wasn't story-led. It was actually, again, at this point, people-led. And uh, the picture that was in the exhibition um, with him was him and his daughter, his two-year-old daughter, who's now living with his parents-in-law uh, because his wife was killed and he wasn't able to support her during the period after the earthquake. Jeunesse was uh, in her late teens, early 20s, probably about, I think she was 19 when we first met her. And she was a good news story, we thought, very positive and upbeat. She was pregnant, um, very uh, beautiful young woman. And she was living in uh, one of the areas where there'd been a um, fairly major collapse of housing. Half her house, which was only a small room, had fallen away during the earthquake. When we visited after six months, she'd actually lost the baby. She'd miscarried the baby, which was very, we were really you know, hugely sad to hear that. But she was back in her original house. And this is just to show you the space that she was coming out of. So she was incredibly well made up. She was beautiful. But she was coming from a very, very small uh, and restricted environment. And the significance of the shoes, sorry, this is just to show you, sorry, this is the cross the valley from her house. So just to show you that the whole valley had kind of moved. People had sort of, the houses had fallen into this ravine. Very, very insecure. But these shoes were very significant because um, all her shoes had been looted after the earthquake. Everyone, she had a collection of shoes that she'd built up over a few years. They all got stolen. And uh, she was obviously quite into fashion and quite into the whole approach of uh, looking beautiful. And this was the first pair of shoes that she'd got um, since the earthquake. And that was, it was just that beginning of you know, life coming back. Um, this is her with her neighbor who was just a, a, a big support and friend to her. Um, and just showing you a sequence of, uh, this is, you know, working away at a picture, trying to get something that sums up who she is. This is a lovely shot, but actually the picture which we used in the exhibition, and which, I've, which is actually, I've got a, a, a book of the exhibition here, if anybody's interested afterwards, which was my, the cover story in some ways, was, um, was this much more reflective image, because she, she was somebody who'd gone from being very joyful to being much more thoughtful and much more measured in her life. And it was just this reflected to me, this is very much who she is now. And uh, that was, you know, just someone who we kept going back to. And, and we visited her again. She had a birthday party with her in January 2011. And finally, in this, this little section, Evelyn was um, 
we found, we, we met her up in a school up in the hills. So way out of, out of uh, Port-au-Prince. She'd been buried for three days. She'd lost her mother and her father. Uh, and she had some really quite um, serious wounds on her face uh, and on her body as well. Uh, and again, I'm just showing you these partly because the question of how, you, how do you show injuries in a way that is gracious and delicate and actually not taking advantage of people, but also is clear. And it's a difficult balance. Again, you want, you know, she did this and it shows clearly her injuries. So it wasn't, I hope it's not taking advantage of who she is. She was very generous in terms of her energy and her time. This story ran in Metro. It ran in actually quite a few other places as well, but uh, Metro was the key thing on the, on the, immediately afterwards. And this is her grandmother who's looking after her. Again, a very complex story. The grandmother was very nervous about the future for her. But with Evelyn, we were able to go back and visit her in Port-au-Prince six months later and show her the magazine that she was in. So this is actually a picture of her in the magazine with her grandmother. Uh, and I've never been in the situation where I've been able to take pictures back and show people what their story has looked like when it's been told in the UK. And it was an incredible experience to see her uh, realizing that her story had been told. And it was, it was, very, it was a very profound thing for us, uh, for both of us actually, when we were there. Uh, she was into everything. I mean, she kind of ran off with my video camera at one point. Uh, she was, she's someone who, you know, I hope has a, has a better life than this, uh, this point it looks like because she had so much energy and, and vitality. And this is the picture which we used in the exhibition. And the reason we, I chose this one again is it's ambivalent. It has that mix of her wonderful excitement and energy in life, but also her grandmother's concern and worry. And she's not totally happy about where things are going. And it's, so it's the balance between uh, the good and the, the, the fear. This is a, oh sorry, I've just clicked forward. It's gonna jump forward. Alfred Eisenstadt, just saying a slightly cliche thing but people are what matters. So we did a thing um, where we, we gave out cameras. It's not an unusual thing. It's been done by lots of charities. We gave out cameras to school children um, and gave them 24 hours to show what matters to them. So this is one of the people who took part in it. And it was just a way of trying to get the story told in a different way, not just through my eyes as an outsider, but through the children's eyes too. So here's a very quick sequence of uh, the images that the children in, up in the hills around, around Leagan and, and up into the top above the Jackmel Road took. Um, they're very different from what I would have taken, but they're pictures that children in the UK, I've shown them to children in schools, they've gone, oh, there's my, that's your pet, or that's your garden, or that's your brother and your sister, and, and they've, they've responded very warmly and very, children particularly, responded very much to these pictures because they, there's your donkey. Um, <laughs> but they, they understood what they're taking pictures of, and they're taken from a child's height, they're taken of things that children are interested in. Um, so how that worked in terms of coverage was very interesting. That was part of the exhibition. We had 20 images the children had taken and 40 that I'd taken in the exhibition. The Guardian, uh, who I've got a reasonable working relationship with, ran a, a, a web page about, um, about the exhibition. So they ran 15 images on there. But then Richard Branson has an iPad-only magazine called Project, and they ran the children's pictures in this magazine, which was the first issue of this, this quite prestigious magazine. So this was really exciting, because there was a very, it was a fantastically positive response to the work the children had produced. The exhibition, just to show you, this is what it looked like um, in London. In Sheffield, it looked much better, because it was a much better venue. <laughs> I, was, I was very pleased with the Sheffield venue. I was pleased it was where it was. David Blunkett came along um, in, in London and um, talked through the exhibition with me. And it, we've got coverage in all sorts of places. This is in the Sheffield Telegraph. Um, this is a magazine, an online magazine called Life Force, which covered uh, uses actually quite a lot of, it's got, not got great design, I don't think, but the, um, a lot of very interesting photographers' work appears there. And even the Sheffield Star uh, covered the exhibitions. So this was a double page spread in the Sheffield Star. It's not necessarily the key, the key point, but it was, it was nice to get coverage in Sheffield. So that's very quick. It's a big run through, quite a major story. And I hope you get a sense of, of what is involved um, covering it both from a journalistic point of view but also in a slightly PR, press, you know, public relations point of view for the charity. The ethics that are involved in telling people stories where they, they uh, have got 
you know, very personal, and very deep issues. I've covered those a little bit, but there's a lot in there that you might want to ask about. And also photographically, maybe some of the logistics, but also the kind of creative side of that. So that's me. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter or look at my blog. That's great. Um, anybody got any questions? Yes. Mm. And it'd be interesting to know how, you say you worked alongside um, NGOs. Yeah, yeah. So it's a couple of points about that. How do you keep your independence? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. And also, how do you keep yourself from distance from the subject? Yeah. Especially, you know, you said about the Harvey, how do you not yes. get stuck in yourself? <laughs> I think that's, so the question is, how do you. Um, Maintain an independence when you're working with an NGO, and also how do, uh, how do you keep a distance, kind of emo an emotional distance or or, or professional distance maybe? Yeah. Okay, that's a really good question, and it's 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 a, it, it touches the heart of going back to a story versus um, going in, visiting, and leaving again. Um, so in terms of in terms of um, in terms of the kind of, the, I think in one sense the question is about, the first question is about values and you know, how, do you, how do you maintain an independence so that you're not just doing a kind of PR, you know, um, you know sugar-coated, this is, this is a nice, sweet thing. The organization that I was working with here is an organization I've worked with for 20 years and I happen to really like their values. They're, they're people who I've worked with and I trust. So in one sense, I'm not a dispassionate observer. I'm not quite going in the way that I would if I was going for The Guardian. I'm not going in going, where is, where's the corruption? Where's the, where's the brokenness? Where's the flaws? I'm actually looking for positive stories that show good things. And so in one sense, I'm not totally neutral at that point. And I would, I would hold my hands up and say that, that is, it, that's why there's a PR element rather than a straight journalistic element to some of this work. However, saying that, I also believe passionately that the best stories are profoundly true, if that makes sense. If you, there's no point in sugarcoating something. There's no point in making something seem nicer than it is because someone will find out. And also, why would you? What's the, you know, what, it's a lie. If it's not true, then it, it, it's a horrible thing to be part of. So um, it's a tension, is all I can say. You, you, I want to tell a true story about, about the people who I meet. And I want... Constantly, I, would, I want people, you know, like Evelyn, if they see the story that has been told about them, for them not to go, what? But to go, yes, that's who I am, that's what's happened to me, that reflects my experience, and that's a fair, truthful, right representation of who I am. It doesn't always happen, and I recognize, you know, I'm not at all claiming that that's what we always manage to do, but that's the goal, is to be actually truthful and honest in, in my reporting, in the end, sometimes an organization might do something different with that. And if they do, then you have to start questioning your relationship. But I've, I've always found that what this organization has done with my material, I'm happy with. In terms of the um, professional distance, in one sense, if you go and visit people very quickly and you just visit them for a day, you can be affected by their story, but then you're back in your own world and you're home again. This was strange because we went back again and again. And I've not done this ever before, and I'm not sure journalistically what the, what the ethics of this are, but actually all three of those people who, we've, who I've shown you pictures of at the end, I've helped um, financially. And I've not done that in any other context. But uh, that was after we've told their stories, but in response to what I saw as genuine need that I possibly could do something about. Now that, I recognize, journalistically, raises all sorts of ethics, all sorts of questions, but I also felt as a, as a person, I couldn't go back and visit them and say, yeah, great, you've, you've, you're still here, how's it going? Oh, can't afford school, can't afford, you know, you, but, you know for Evelyn, who's eight years old, she couldn't go to school. The risk for her was that she wouldn't ever get an education. I, mean, I haven't paid for education, but I've given a little bit of money that has helped a little bit for a little bit of time. And again, does that make any difference? I don't know, I hope it does, I hope it does a little bit, but it's not. It's not enough, but it's also, it was an unusual situation. So, um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, not normal. Yes? Um, this is a person, and this is a debate that's been for a long time. And uh, human caring as men, and uh, take pictures or to do, the, do the interviews as a journalist, which one you think is more 
important. What, photos or pictures? Uh, photos or interviews? Uh, um, no, no, I mean human caring. Oh, human air. caring, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in, when I showed you that picture of, um, of the gen genocide refugees at the very beginning in, Rwanda, in Zaire from Rwanda, I, I had an awful experience there, and I, I wasn't sure what I was doing in the context. I didn't know why I was in Zaire at that point. And I showed the pictures I'd taken to someone called Mike Goldwater, who's a, is a very renowned uh, photojournalist. And he said, you don't look like you enjoy being there. And I said, no, I didn't. It was horrible. And he said, you've got to be clear about why you're in a situation. There's no point going into somewhere like Zaire or into Haiti and not understanding what your purpose is. So he said, you've got to tell the story. That's what your job is. And you're there to tell the story and make sure that then people, wherever you're sending the story to, understand what is happening. So it's, again, it's a balance. All these things are a balance. But in, in that context, if I was in Haiti and had no... Um, clear understanding that my purpose was to tell the story of what I was seeing, then I would be using resources that could be used much better to actually help people. So my, it, the, the key point was to tell the story, make sure that that story got heard by as many people as possible in the UK uh, and, and other audiences, but also to do that with, with humanity and with, with, a, with a caring. But I, it's not my, I, I'm not a professional aid worker, I don't, you know, I can't fix someone's wounds, I can't, you know, feed people, I don't know all the protocols, but I can get other people to respond to the need and to the positives as well. So I hope, so you have to work as part of a team, I guess, and so you work with people who you know can help and know that what you're doing, in this context anyway, is hope is trying to help explain the story, explain the need and explain what can be done. So it's, that is kind of caring, I hope. Does that make sense? Is that, yeah, yeah. So yeah, go on. Just because you're standing up, I can see you more easily. Thank you. I would like to, uh, I, I would like to thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation. Two questions. Mm. One regarding, you said at one moment that you felt you had to take photos for an exhibition. Uh -huh. And my first question would be, what's the role of the exhibitions, uh -huh. for the yeah. first exhibition for drawing the, the consciousness and the attention of our attention regarding things that are happening in the world. And the second, uh, the second question would be, is it different to take photographs thinking on an exhibition than uh, thinking about having them published in a newspaper? Yeah, okay. So, um, the, I think exhibitions have, have a role that is important because they offer a second chance to hear a story. So a newspaper obviously is today, and it's now, and then it's gone. Whereas, um, you know, and magazine features are the same. You can get longer term, so it doesn't need to be an exhibition. And I've not done many exhibitions at all in my life. But because this was such a major story and also so invisible in terms of any in-depth reporting, it was a way of, of making that material have an extra life. So we got, you know, we got significant coverage when the exhibition came out, which was 18 months after the earthquake. So you're starting to keep the story alive, helping people remember what's happening and keep responding. So that, I think in that sense, it's, it's valuable. Um, visually, definitely a different agenda from a newspaper. Yes, yeah, so a newspaper is looking for something very immediate, very clear, something that tells the story with one, you know, with one single image. And over an exhibition, you've got 40 images or 60 or whatever it is to tell a story much more slowly. People spend a lot more time in an exhibition than they would do with a newspaper piece. There's extended captions. Um, and you can be a bit more creative in some ways. You can shoot things that might not work on a printed page, but actually if you stand and look at them for a while, you go, yeah, I get that. So it, it doesn't necessarily, I might have shot those images anyway, but I wouldn't have sent them to a newspaper. So having the freedom of thinking, yes, I'm looking at an exhibition as a possibility even, meant that I shot things in a slightly more abstract way as well, which was nice for me to do. Uh, yes. Do you think, Sorry, um, I'll come to you next. Picturesque, something you can't, uh, something to exploit probably. The, uh, the growing number of like uh, citizen journalists and access to cameras, yeah. um, and I mean, in terms of Haiti, the morale case for there. Yeah. Getting, yeah. Um, do you think that's the case? <laughs> um, I think I think there's a there's a real risk of photography being undervalued, um, and 
I think that's because, as you say, it's very easy to get a, a high quality image. And if you know if you're the only person there, then you you've got an image which is saleable. I think that, and, and selling images of disaster is a very morally challenging thing. Um, you know, I was just looking at the front cover today from from uh, Gaza Strip and the car that's just been blown up, and you go. That's, yes, you know, that's a hard thing to be doing. Um, and demotics uh, and all of the citizen journalism stuff, yeah, I think there's a risk. And I think it's led partly by people who want to be photographers, understandably. And, and therefore, they undervalue their own work. And um, picture desks will certainly go for the cheap and the free. I recognize we need to stop. No. OK. <laughs> um, what was the final question? You said? About the morale case. Yes. I think there was an element of misunderstanding about that, and I think it's become much more complex than probably it should have done. But a, is it AP who... Um, AFP. AFP, yes. Uh, I think they, they shot themselves in the foot. They should just have gone, yes, yeah, sorry, we made a mistake. We'll pay up. Um, and I'm, it's a shame that it's gone that way. But he's right. And uh, clearly, sorry, I'm going back here. Yes. Hi. Uh, oh, thank you for the presentation. Incidentally, I'm Eric Chan, and I was very surprised. Ah, OK. Oh, well. Um, Yeah. How, how do you handle certain situations where that person is in a very vulnerable situation and you're there with a camera and yep. your face is trying to get a decent image? Yep. How do you handle things like that? And also, when you're doing photographic essays, how do people get comfortable? How do you get them to be more comfortable in themselves in their lives where they forget that you're there with a camera and they can get a candid shot? Yeah. So um, I'll answer the second bit first, because that's in one sense a bit easier. It, it's um, how do you get people comfortable with you being there if you're doing an extended uh, photo essay? And, and it's about time. It's about just spending. It's about, well, it's about two things, time and being nice to people. <laughs> so actually finding ways, even without language, of communicating uh, what you're trying to do and encourage, you know, often working with the translator so you're able to do that. But you have to have an implied consent, even if it's not a written piece of paper. You, if you're spending time in someone's home, you know, you've, it's a real privilege. You've got you've to recognize that somebody is allowing you into their lives in a way that you would find hard, I would find hard to allow someone into my life here in, in Sheffield. And that, that's a real, you know, something to be treated with, with grace and gentleness. And that's in one sense very different from the kind of conflict situation where there's something very sudden happening and, and there's a risk to the person involved. They're very vulnerable. Um, and again, you have to do it gently and carefully, but you also have to weigh up, I guess, the morality on the, fl on the go as you're going along. Is the, is, am I intruding in a way that is offensive, or is this a story which actually really makes a difference? And, and this image will help change, maybe change the situation. I mean, that's a kind of crusading journalist viewpoint rather than just a straight hard news photographer might just go, well, I'll just take the picture anyway. And I, 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 one of the reasons I don't do much hard news is that I find that quite hard emotionally to just go, boom, that's what I'm doing. So I, I, I much prefer to work alongside people who understand why I'm there and have given me permission to be part of their lives because, yeah, because that just seems a much more human way of working. <laughs> I try and do that as much as possible. Um, have we got any time? Let me just stop. Sorry, everybody. I'm, uh... <laughs> I'll do a post presentation. Yeah, I know. I, I apologize. I went to find something. Um, and um, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I, I must say, Richard is, you know, a world top photographer. And people here in the department ask me, where did you get it from? How did you know about him? And, the, and that he was based in Sheffield, because for us, it was a discovery. And um, I said, it was a coincidence. My partner happened to share a panel with mm -hmm. him a couple of months ago. And she told me, do you know this person? And I was like, what? So the good news <laughs> is now we're going to try to link Richard into the department. So hopefully he'll be doing something with you in, 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 in January next year. So yeah. welcome thank to you. the department. Thank you. That was great. Thank and you. thank you very much for such a brilliant and very interesting um, intervention. Uh, would you have a couple of minutes downstairs? Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah. will stay a couple of minutes downstairs. So if you want to talk to him in the foyer downstairs, he'll an additional question. I'm sorry about not allowing any more questions, but we ran out of time, and we have the next um, session in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Welcome to Sheffield. Eh? Thank you. <laughs>